Hi, today we're going to be revisiting a little project which I started when my son Camden was born. So when he was born I thought it'd be really useful to be able to have some low level lighting in the room so that we could see what we were doing when we were doing the nighttime feeds and that kind of thing. So I bought these little night lights from AliExpress at the time. You can now buy these from eBay, you can buy them from Amazon, you can also buy them from Banggood as well. And the main problem with these is that they were way too bright. So there's a little PIR sensor so that when you start moving, the lights turn on. They just turn on instantly and at quite a high brightness. Um, it's got this nice diffused cover and then it takes three AAA batteries and then just inside there's a very bare bones bit of electronics. So a little PIR circuit and then a single white LED. So what I originally did was just change the resistor so that it wasn't very bright at all but that was sort of limited usefulness and I kind of wanted something that we could leave on all night at very low level and then maybe turn up a little bit uh, when we needed to be able to see a little bit better. So what I did was I originally got some PCBs made, I think these were made at PCB panel and actually these have been running for quite a long time now but I want to build a new version firstly because um, Camden wants some extra features now that he's a bit older but also I want to build some for my nieces and nephews. So these circuit boards were quite straightforward. Let's zoom in a little bit. So what we've got is some high brightness white LEDs. We've also got two amber LEDs and two red LEDs and therefore you can control the brightness and also the colour because at night time actually our eyes work quite well with amber or with red light and that doesn't disturb our sleep so you're able to have these on at quite a low level and uh, happily go to sleep with them on. Then on the other side of the PCB we've got the electronics and there's not a great deal on here so we've got a little PIC, I think that's a PIC 18F. It's got uh, a couple of PWM channels so I use that to drive those three channels of LEDs. We've got a 3.3 volt regulator for that microcontroller. Uh, not assembled onto the PCB at the moment but there is a infrared sensor and you control these through means of a infrared remote control. And then there's the programming port and then the uh, the power at the bottom here. So these were really nice, but uh, Camden wants all the colors. So what I did is I had some PCBs made at JLC PCB. And the date is correct. I've been sitting on these for quite a long time, um, but now it's time to get this project underway. So what we've got this time is a few different channels of coloured LEDs, so we've got red, amber, green and blue and then there's four white LEDs, one in each corner. There are some uh, little drivers associated with each channel and then on the other side is pretty much how it was before. So we've got the microcontroller, the 3.3 volt regulator and the infrared remote control. So these PCBs are 1.6 millimetres, they are white finish but they have the two ounce copper and I was hoping that would just provide a little bit of easier heat sinking for the LEDs. If you take a look at the previous design, I had some fairly heavy heat sinking around the white LEDs, but I didn't actually ever drive the LEDs at full power. On these ones, we've got four lower power LEDs, but they are onto relatively large bits of ground plane and the extra two ounce copper should help get the heat away from that and spread it all over the board a little bit more evenly. So this was a option at JLC PCB. Um, it did cost a little bit more to have the two ounce copper and what that means is basically the thickness of copper plated onto the um, PCB is twice the thickness that it would be if you have the standard one ounce copper. And then we've got the gold finish as I normally have on all of my boards. Let's take a little look at the circuit. Right, so here's the circuit and to start off with we've got the microcontroller which is a PIC24F32KA302 which is a nice compact low power microcontroller. Not that the low power matters particularly in this design because we're powering this from either a USB power supply or from a 5 volt power adapter. And to drop the 5 volt down to 3.3 we've got a microchip MCP1703 3.3 volt linear regulator. We've got the usual programming header which I normally have on my design so that we can program this once it's on the PCB and then just around the microcontroller itself we've just got a timekeeping crystal so a 32 kilohertz uh, watch crystal to keep time and the reason that I've got this on here is originally in the first revision of the design 
With the remote control, you could tell it how long to stay on for before it starts dimming down to zero brightness. So if you only wanted it on for two hours, for example, you could press the number two, and then after two hours, it would start to dim down. I think I'm going to get rid of that feature in this version, um, just because actually it's fine just having it on all the time, and then we just turn it off in the morning. At the top here, we've got the LED drivers. So these are for the white LEDs, and the way that this is configured will actually provide a constant current to the LEDs, provided that the 3.3 volt regulator does regulate properly. So it's using the property which I've explained in a video previously. If you click on the link above, you can go to that video. But basically, because we're controlling the voltage into the base, we then know that that voltage minus 0.6 volts is going to be the voltage at this node here. And therefore, you can set the current by using Ohm's law, uh, V divided by R, gives the current through the LED. And then the current remains constant regardless of what type of LED is used and the voltage drop of that LED. So at the top here we've got the white LEDs which are Osram Juris E3s. And then further down we've got the coloured LEDs. I think these were Kingbright KA3529 type LEDs. These are quite high brightness and they've got exactly the same circuit each. And those are just connected to GPIO pins on the microcontroller, which allow us to PWM the LEDs to change the brightness. So let's talk a little bit about the remote control for these lights. Now, you can find these modules on eBay really easily. Just search for Arduino infrared remote control, or sometimes they're called keys remote control or Zinda remote control. And they're all the same. You basically get this uh, little infrared remote. It's got a CR2032 coin cell in the bottom. You just pull out the tab when you get it and want to use it. And it also comes with a little infrared decoder that you can then plug into your Arduino. Or in my case, you can use it to look at what codes are being transmitted by the infrared transmitter so that I know how to implement it in the software. So these infrared remote controls are pretty straightforward to interface with most microcontrollers and especially if you use the 38 kilohertz receiver modules there's really not a great deal to do in the firmware. The way that the transmitters work is they use the NEC infrared protocol in this particular case although there are other encoding schemes. To transmit a logical zero you've got a 560 microsecond burst of infrared followed by a break of 560 microseconds. If you want to transmit a 1, you transmit the same 560 microsecond burst of infrared, but then the break is much longer, so you've got 1.68 milliseconds of silence. And the actual carrier frequency in this case is 38 kilohertz, and that carrier frequency is important because that allows you to move away from sort of the DC, from background interference, and it shifts the transmission up to 38 kilohertz away from other sources of interference within your environment. So these are quite resilient, work quite well with other lighting sources in the room and with other things flashing on and off because the receiver is specifically looking for that 38 kilohertz carrier. So the actual NEC protocol is a little bit more complex than just sending ones and zeros. You've got what's described on the screen here. So first of all, you've got the AGC burst which is primarily to allow the auto gain control on the receiver to calibrate to make sure that it can see the infrared signal properly. But it's also a really useful method to determine the start of a transmission in your firmware. You can look for that 9 milliseconds of transmission and then you know that you're about to receive some data. That's then followed by 4.5 milliseconds of nothing and then you've got 32 bits to be transmitted after that. So first of all you've got the address then you've got the not address, so the complement of that, followed by the command, and then similarly we've got the complement of that command, and all of that allows for some means of verifying that the data that you have received is correct. So if you see that your address and the inverse of the address don't match up, then you know just to discard that frame because you didn't see it properly. So on the bench, all I've done is just set up the infrared receiver, and then we've got the remote control here, and we can have a little look at what it looks like on the oscilloscope. So if I press one of the buttons here, you can see we've got the burst of 9 milliseconds, followed by the blanking period. Just note that it's inverted in terms of logic. When it receives the infrared signal, 
this device actually pulls the logic level down low. So we've got the burst followed by the blanking period and then we've got the control byte and then in this case it's zeros so eight zeros followed by the inverse of that so eight ones. Then you can see the actual data being transmitted. So we've got zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. And then we've got the inverse of that. So we've got one, 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 zero, one, 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 one. And basically what I've done is in the firmware, I've just gone through and I tested what each of the buttons did, decoded that, and then in the firmware, we can then use the remote control. Now you'll notice sometimes it captures something a little bit different. So here we just get the nine millisecond pulse followed by the blanking period, and then this very short pulse. And what this means is that you are holding down the button. So if I press any button, for example, this is the up button on the remote control. If I then hold down that button, you get that same pattern. And if I hold down a different button, you see it goes back to that same one. So that's the repeat character. And you can use that to determine when someone's holding down the button so they wanted a repeat action. So we can have a little look at the firmware to see what's going on. So first of all, we've got some hash defines here which just defines some of the timing. So that's determining the pulse widths for various stages in the protocol. Then I've got the mappings for each of the keys on the remote control. So I went through, pressed each button in turn, worked out what code it was, and then I can simply look up the name. So for example, if I'm waiting for an OK button, I can look for IR underscore OK. And when I receive that, then I know that someone's pressed the OK button. Then we've got a little bit of firmware in an interrupt routine. In this case, I'm using the input compare module because I can use that to automatically time pulses on the port pin. So for example, here we're looking for that start bit you'll notice I'm comparing it between two values. So IR start low, IR start high. That's because the timing on these infrared transmitters isn't very tightly controlled. So there's no crystal oscillator in these transmitters. Therefore, you do need to allow some kind of tolerance to account for the difference between the timing on your microcontroller and the timing of the remote control. So we've got a little bit of tolerance there. We're looking for that nine millisecond pulse. Then we know we're gonna start receiving data after that point. So we look for whether it's a one or a zero. Again, we're comparing between two different set points to allow for some tolerance. And then once we've received all 32 bits, we then do the data integrity check. Now, because we're provided with two copies of the control byte and the data byte, you can very easily do a data integrity check and then throw out the packet if it doesn't turn out to be correct. So you can see there's not a great deal of code there to allow a great deal of flexibility adding a remote control to your project. Now today we're gonna to be trying out some new solder products to assemble the PCB. And Chris Ward from Solder King Assembly Materials very kindly reached out to see if I wanted to try these. So first of all, we've got some rework gel and hopefully you've watched my video on solder fluxes it'll be really interesting to see how this behaves also very interesting to note the expiry date is quite a long time in the future it looks like it lasts around two years which is brilliant because often you'll buy solder paste or solder fluxes and you'll use a bit of it and then it will sit on the shelf for ages and then when you come to use it again it's no good so it's really interesting that it's got quite a long expiry date compared to some of the other products and then we've got some lead-free based soldering items. So with lead-based solder becoming more and more scarce in the UK and in Europe, it basically seems like we're going to end up using lead-free at some point in the future as hobbyists. And I thought, why not take out the opportunity to try some of these? So we've got a bismuth-based solder paste. This is a low temperature solder paste. And I've used bismuth solders in the past and had really good results with them. Apparently you can have some trouble with tin whiskers and that kind of thing from these types of solder paste, but I've not seen that myself. And uh, you know, we'll see how it behaves anyway on this board. Then we've got some lead-free solder wire, and this is quite a unique construction. Apparently it's doped with various chemicals. I'll list them on the screen because I can't remember what they are, but it should give very nice shiny solder joints and also flow really nicely. So we'll use that to solder the through hole parts on the board. Right, so we've got three PCBs here that's holding in the round board underneath. And the idea is that I can just take these out and put another one in in place. And then I've got the stencil itself hinged on a piece of tape. 
and the solder paste is connected up to my solder paste dispenser and we just want to dispense some solder paste across the top and then we'll spread it down the board. And that's fairly soft in consistency. Let's try spreading it down the board. And that spreads quite nicely. I've just missed a bot bit at the bottom there. Right, so annoyingly I've made a bit of a mistake here. On the schematic I've put the microcontroller as the PIC 24F32KA302 which is a 28 pin SSOP package. What I've actually laid out on the board is the version ending 301 which is the 20 pin package and I must have made an error when designing the part in Proteus because I've given it the wrong name but everything else lines up perfectly and I clearly made this mistake before because if I look in the box with version 1 PCBs I've got a whole ton of the incorrect microcontroller plus I've ordered another 10 for these boards but we can still reflow these PCBs see how this new solder flows and then when the new parts arrive in part 2 of this video we can then um, put the correct part on here with the hot air gun and reflow it by hand. Now bismuth based solder paste typically melt at 138 degrees C so we could actually reflow this entirely with the infrared preheating station however once the board starts getting a bit warm I am just going to reflow it with a little bit of hot air from a distance just to help things move along more quickly. So just looking under the microscope everything all looks to be okay with this solder paste. We've got reasonably good shiny joints, not really too much graininess which you sometimes see on some lead free solders and I had no problems with the reflow of the solder itself. It's a bit of a shame that I'm not going to be able to finish this project in today's video because of this missing microcontroller but in part 2 of this video we'll fit this to the board fit the LEDs on the other side and flash it with firmware and then we'll be able to see this project working. So thank you to Chris for sending through the solder and also to JLC PCB for providing the PCBs. Hopefully you found the video useful and until next time, thanks for watching.